What's going on, my friends? This is King Solomon back again with another video. This is the second video in the series, a Black History Month series. This is a series about black men who were builders, uh, producers, entrepreneurs, inspiring stories about these men. These are men that you probably may have known about, but probably don't know about. And that's the whole point to shed light on these brothers that, that can inspire us to today. All right. So today's story is about a man who um, an entrepreneur, multimillionaire, very rich, wealthy man who came from impoverished backgrounds, a real rags to riches story and uh, someone who started literally started from the bottom and made it all the way to the top. Right. Who am I talking about? This man is no other than a black man named Samuel B. Fuller, a black American entrepreneur in the 1950s, who literally during his time, he was considered probably one of the richest black men, one of the richest black men in America in the 1950s. His story is very, very interesting. He started from humble beginnings and he was born to a family in Louisiana of sharecroppers, right? Very, very poor. He had to drop out of school to go work in the sixth grade but guess what he had an entrepreneurial spirit and even at a young age this guy was selling stuff he was always he was the type of person that you know if he had one pencil you know what i mean he's gonna find if he had two pencils he's gonna rent one out or lend one out he was just that type of guy a real true hustler right and so what he would do he used to sell all type of products you know anything that he knew people would need he would sell it. He would find a way to make some money. That was that was how he was. At age 15, his family moved to Nashville. But guess what? The sad thing about it, he was faced with even more hardship because two years after that, his mother passed away and was leaving him to um, basically have to raise six of his siblings. Right. Um, a lot of people came and tried to offer assistance, offer aid. But he was the type of person that he didn't believe in handouts. So he turned everything down and he said, you know what, he's going to find a way to make it. And, um, you know, he, he was that type of person. So he relocated from Nashville to Chicago. And this man, he was a person that he believed in hard work. So when he moved to Chicago, you know, he took up a whole bunch of, you know, menial jobs, you know, little jobs to make ends meet. You know, sometimes in life it, 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 it go like that. You know, sometimes you're going to have to do some sort of jobs that, you know what I mean? This is you're, you might look at yourself and say, you know, what, I'm better than this, but it's not about where you are. It's about where you're going. Right. So that's what he was doing. He was uh, working in a coal yard. You know, can you believe that? You know, that, and that's that's not a very easy job. This is a hard, hard. This was hard work. Right. So during the Great Depression, which was in the 1930s, he began working as an insurance agent at the Commonwealth Burial Association, which was a black owned firm. Right. And he worked his way up and had a secure position in the business. But he decided to, you know, move out and not settle because even though he was making pretty good money, he said, you know what? I want to own something for myself. I want my own piece of the pie. So a twenty five dollar loan that he had which he obtained by using his car as a security deposit, $25 in that time was about $375 in our money today, right? He decided that he was going to go and start his own business. That's what he was going to do. He was going to go start his own business and he had help with his future wife, right? A woman by the name of Lestine Thornton. And, uh, you know, that, that that's another good thing where, you know, this woman was able to help him out and she was able to partner with him and he, you know, was able to become his wife. She helped him purchase a load of soap. Right. And what he would do with that is go door to door and sell the soap. Right. Door to door. Right. And he was very, very successful. He made some money and he was smart, you know, because instead of um, taking that money and blowing it, tricking off, doing all these kind of things blowing the money in, in the strip club, you know, buying another car, doing all of that stuff, taking a vacation. This guy decided to reinvest his money and take that thousand dollars and reinvest. Right. And so another thing that was going on during that time, and it's one of those things that you realize if anybody who's a business person, sometimes you realize when you start going out there on your own and when you start pushing it and when you, you know, you, you, you leave it all out there on the field, 
sometimes life has a way of rewarding you, putting opportunities in front of you so you can go forward. Now, his opportunity was that during that time, there was a lot of black families that was coming into Chicago, right? Especially on the south side of Chicago, a lot of families. This was the great what was known as the first great migration. A lot of families from the south, a lot of black families were moving from the south to Chicago, especially the south side of Chicago, right? So in that, he saw a potential gold mine. He was the manager at the time. And while he was the manager, he, well, he was promoted to manager at the, the Commonwealth Association, the, the Burial Association. While he had his job, he was working his other business. This is a good example. You know, that's how it is. You know, as, as men, we have all our jobs and everything like that. But guess what? You also should have a side hustle, something that you should be thinking about for the future to build, to work on. Uh, on your downtime instead of just kicking back and just, uh, you know, just wasting time. You should find something, some sort of skill because everybody has a skill. And this is what he did. Right. He used his his selling skills, um, his sales ability. And what he was also doing was growing his business and he grew his business to include about 30 products. And not only that, he decided to, to have uh, leverage in his business. So he hired other salesmen as well. He trained people how to sell and he went on and, and, and went and, and, and started to sell, right? Um, and, and made more money, right? It's growing, growing his business. By 1939, so he, he started everything off in what year? In the, I think it was the 1930s. By 1939, he opened his own factory, right? So now he went from just, you know, buying and selling, going door to door to now he's, he got a brick and mortar business. Now he, you know, he has a, he has a, he has a actual location. He has a factory. 1947, the person who was his supplier, he actually saved them from going under by guess what? Purchasing the business, right? So now he got more money, newly acquired capital. He decided that guess what? If it, if it, if it's a product, if it's an item, and people want it, I'm gonna sell it, right? So this man started to sell everything from deodorant all the way to suits, right? And then he started to, to branch out, diversify. He decided to purchase black newspapers, you know? Um, one of the newspapers that he purchased and he you know owned was the Pittsburgh Courier and the New York Age, right? So he's getting real big in Chicago, right? And he purchased a movie theater, um, the Chicago Real Regal Theater, right? And also the South Center Department Store. So this man was just getting into everything. This guy was using his money and diversifying and really, really growing his business. Now, when it got to the political side of things, he was a Republican, right? He was all about, you know, being a Republican and everything like that. And his comments and his point of view, it kind of led him into a, into a little bit of hot water, right? He started up the Southside NAACP, and he was also involved in some way in the Montgomery bus boycott. You know, the, the same one with Martin Luther King uh, down in Alabama. He was involved in that because guess what? He looked at it and he actually talked to Martin Luther King and said, listen, the bus company right now, right? We're boycotting the bus, which is a good idea. We're not giving them any money. This is very, very good. But guess what? They're losing money, right? So instead of waiting for the government to, you know, change the laws and everything, let's squeeze these guys, right? His idea was let's squeeze them. And since they don't have any money, let's pool together. And guess what? Let's buy the bus company. Yes, that's what he told Martin Luther King. Let's buy the bus company. Instead of waiting for the government, these guys are racist. They don't like us. You know what? Forget them. Let's buy the bus company. Martin Luther King at the time, you know, he, you know, he was, remember, Martin Luther King was young. He was like 25, 26 years old. He shot down the idea. He didn't think it was going to work. Not enough people put their money up. And guess what? The plan fell through, right? But this was his philosophy. He felt that the way to end segregation and discrimination, segregation in the South and discrimination in the North was through black achievement, not government intervention, right? So that was his idea. So this man, Samuel B. Fuller, you can see he was into everything. And as 
when they were looking at his sums or money, they found out that during that time, it's very, very possible that he was the richest black man throughout the 1950s, right? Richest black American man in the 1950s. They're saying that his cosmetic company was bringing in about $18 million annually in 1950, which in today's dollars is over $170 million. This is a more, not even that, which is fascinating, that this black man in the 1950s, in the Jim Crow era, right, was making over $170 million, but this part is even more fascinating. His sales team, which included over 5,000 members, a third of those people were white. See, what happened, I forgot to mention this, is that he didn't let anybody know that the company, that he was the owner of that company. The, the 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 cosmetics company he didn't let anybody know that he was the owner and so that was the interesting thing one third of his one third of his um his his sales team was white and it, it so happened that i think it was the white citizens council they tried to when they found out that it was a black man that was running the whole thing they really try to put it out there that guess what you guys are working for a black man so that it could discourage people from you know being a part of the business but he was paying people he was he was paying folks and he was not only paying them but he was involved he was the person that was training them creating the training material to help them to be better salesperson there was a lot of those people who left even white people who took his training was working in his company and then went off to start their own businesses based on the training that that black man taught him right taught them right so this is where he started to you know this the story card starts to get kind of bad kind of kind of kind of sad and sort of a way because he was he could have been a rich man that just sat back and just said you know what? i'm making money i'm not gonna speak my mind i'm gonna keep quiet but you know how real men are real men speak their mind as I said in one of my other videos, my first video, you can go check that one out, right? He made a comment at an induction ceremony, which he said, a lack of understanding of the capitalist system and not racial barriers is what's keeping black people from making progress, right? So that's what he said at a ceremony and they took that those words and he said something else for in an interview, which he said, this is what he said. He said, Negroes are not discriminated against because of the color of their skin. They are discriminated against because they do not have anything to offer that people want to buy, right? So you can already understand. I mean, in today's culture, you already know that would that would set a lot of people off edge. And you can imagine that back then, 50, 60, 70 years ago, yeah, they, you know, they enacted cancel culture back then too. Because guess what they did? They said, you know what? Cancel this man. Nobody buy his products. You know, they try to really you know, try to hurt his business. But I mean, they couldn't really stop him because he, you know, at the end of the day, once your product is good, your product is good. And he had a lot of good products, but his reputation was tarnished in the black community. You know, his reputation was greatly tarnished and, and that hurt his reputation. Those comments that he had made. Now he started to get into legal trouble in 1968 because he was charged with violating the securities Federal Securities Act after he sold unregistered promissory notes and his company went bankrupt in 1971. Even though he was able to bounce back a little bit, uh, he 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 went he bounced back a bit, but it wasn't at the heights in which he was before. You know, his company started to only, I think, only make about three hundred thousand dollars annually. And um, you know, while that was still, you know, that's a large sum of money, especially into that was still would be considered about a million dollars in today's money um you know it was a big fall when you're making 170 million dollars a year and then you know you're making one or two million dollars a year that's a big fall you know what i mean you're still doing okay but it was a, it was a pretty big drop right so he retired in the 1970s due to health problems and unfortunately he died in 1988 um but what can we learn from this 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 story was a was a very interesting story to me because number one he was a man that spoke his mind he spoke his mind about things that he saw he saw certain things his way yeah i mean can you imagine everybody was focused on marching and doing all these things he was like no i don't think this is the way to go this is this is the way to go we need to focus on building we need to focus on economics he was a big proponent of focusing on economics and not focusing on having the government 
to be the one to to help people you know he figured he figured that what we need to do as a, as a people was focus on building an economy system and and not worrying about the government right um another thing that we can look at is his entrepreneurial skills this man he came from the bottom he didn't have no help he came from the bottom and he built himself all the way to the top so even if you disagree with his political and personal views i mean i mean who doesn't love a story of somebody who started from the bottom and made it to the top so this is our second um second uh person for the month in our series samuel b fuller you can go check him out and let me know what you think about him let me know uh did you learn anything new did you know about him before i'm gonna leave a link to the to you know a couple articles where you can find out a little more information about him and uh yeah let me know what you think all right so uh it's king solomon thank you for listening and I'll see you on the next video. Peace.